My name is Joseph Sinclair. I've been writing software for more years than I care to admit. Um, been working with C++ since a few years after Stroustrup originally pr um, proposed it. I've seen it since before it had the standard library. I saw the standard library come in and I followed it through the more recent very substantial upgrades in the standards. Um, and that's what this talk is about. C++ today is not what it was just a few years ago. And that's important because the language has gotten far more powerful and far easier to use. Um, I've included up here on screen just a few examples of things that are new in C++ that make it much easier to write clean and correct code. Now, one thing that's always been a problem with C++ with any C-based language has been memory management. That's the core difficulty of most C programs. Um, in 98, the first true standard for C++ was released. And it had a few nice things and it had a few really bad things in it. Um, in 2003, a standard was released by ISO that almost everyone just completely ignored. Uh, the reason for that is it didn't do a whole lot. Um, it didn't fix all things that people cared about. And more importantly, some of the primary compiler vendors just completely skipped it. They said, nope, we don't care. We're not going to implement that standard. Um, in 2006, that started to change. Most importantly, Microsoft actually started to listen to the standards community and began to pay attention to the standards. That was critical because that was the key blocker in really moving standards forward. Um, they still slowed things down, but by 2010 they were on board pretty strongly with getting the standards moved forward. And in 2011 we finally got a proper new version of the standard. We've had a new version of the standard every three years after that. So we have the, the C++ 11, there's also C++ 14, and last month the executive committee voted to approve C++ 17. ISO hasn't approved it because it has to go through a final review process, which this being the International Standards Organization takes several months, but it will be approved hopefully by the end of the year, if not very early next year. So what's changed? This is big. So we have a few things. First of all, there are limitations to using it, but there is an operator quote quote may not sound like a big deal, but you now have string constants. Not character constants, string constants. So you can actually declare a constant standard string. In fact, I've got an example here where, now you don't have const expert, and I'll get into that in a minute. And I have the wrong character there. That should be an ampersand, because I can't type in the middle of the night. Um, you can have a string reference that is const, and refers to a const value. Now, in most cases, if you tried that without the operator, it's just going to go poof, and you'll get a weird reference that's off in the middle of nowhere, because that string value is not going to stick around. But thanks to that s at the end, the operator actually converts it to a statically held constant string that is in constant global memory, which allows me to use a string reference, which is const, and it pushes the whole thing into the compiler's world, not your runtime construction. Bigger than that is right below it here, string view. Now this is new for C++ 17. So it's an experimental in the GNU compiler prior to version 7. Um, it's still somewhat an experimental in 7, but it's an inline namespace and you can ignore it. Um, shortly after the beginning of the year, the latest GCC should have that out of experimental and in final um, namespace if you implement dash, dash std equals C++ 17. <laughs> um, what a string view is, a string view is actually a view into a string. So it doesn't hold the memory itself. It holds reference to a portion of a string that's held somewhere else. Now, you can't see it because 
I don't have room for it, but I'll scroll over here. The operator for that is SV for string view. Now, what string view allows me to do is create what's called a const expr. Const expr is an expression that you've told the compiler is a constant expression. There are some rules around this, and they vary depending on how recent your standard is. But the key is, if it's a scalar variable, it can be const expr, which means the compiler takes care of all the construction, all the memory management. It is handled before you complete your, your compilation. So your references to it are references to fully constructed global memory. If it is a simple enough object, most critically, its destructor must be trivial then it can be made const expert. If it can be made const expert and it's an object, the same thing. It is constructed at compile time. So this string view costs absolutely nothing at runtime. And critically, I can use it anywhere that I could use a constant. So if I took that string view reference and placed it somewhere that's expecting, the compiler is expecting a fixed constant it will work. The compiler will accept it and will place it in. Because the compiler has it fully constructed at compilation time. This is one of the ways that you can re reduce static memory allocation at runtime and clean up some of the race conditions that happen during static allocation. Other things. We have four each loops. So in C++, starting with C++11, when I have a collection object, any of the standard collections, map, list, vector, even an array, I can do an, an iteration through those without having to be specific about iterators and all the other complexities that come with iterating. I can just say for, and I, can, I used auto here. The auto, this was a big change in C++3. The auto keyword no longer describes storage. It actually, just, it actually allows you to put it as a placeholder for a type. And it tells the compiler, I don't really know what type this is. I think it's roughly this. Figure it out for me. The compiler infers the type based on what you're referencing. So in this case, the, type of, the templated type of your collection would be what's replaced, what replaces that auto keyword. But the key here is that the compiler internally emits all of the code necessary to iterate through the collection, assigning in each iteration of the loop the, the dereference of the iterator to the variable I've declared. So the variable here, test, will be of the type of the templated, of the templated type of the collection. Um, so to put this a little more simply, let's say that collection here, um, make sure I got that right, and of course I didn't because I can't type with these lights in my face. There we go. Very reflective keyboard. So let's say I've defined the collection this way, okay? And somewhere in between the definition in this point, uh, this declaration in this point, um, and the next line, I, I, I go ahead and I put in some values, so. Okay, so we, we put some values in it. What test is going to be at this point is a standard string which itself is a templated type. This can get pretty complicated. Um, a piece of code I was working on just recently, the template type for the vector is almost two lines of text at 80 characters per line because it's a template of a template of a template of a template of a template. Um, unfortunately, there are no type desks for any of that. And that's 
primarily what auto is for, is just simplifying the code so that you don't have to type out these very, very long, very complex template instantiations. You can just say, hey, compiler, you know what this is? Put it in there. Um, this also gets a little, more a little more useful with maps because the standard map uses a pair as its iterator type. Um, and so trying to type out standard pair template this, template that, template this is a pain in the neck and auto just saves typing. Um, it also helps when you're developing and you're not sure what the type is going to be until you're done and you keep changing it for whatever reason. You don't have to retype all your autos. Um, so it just simplifies things. So in this case, test would be a standard string. It's actually a reference to standard string. So it's a reference to the value. Um, the value there is that, I don't, again, I'm not dereferencing things all over the place. I just say, hey, I have my string. I can do whatever I need to do with it and continue on. Um, if I made it const, so if I go up here and say this is a vector of const standard string, great. I don't have to retype the next couple lines. It's a const standard string in the iterator as well. Again, saves me a lot of headaches. So that's a nice improvement. There are a lot of these throughout the standard library and throughout the code. There are a lot of new, uh, there are seven or eight new keywords, um, const expert, auto, a few others. Auto is a reuse of an existing keyword. Um, and the goal for a lot of this is just to make the language smoother. Something that was in C++ 3 that a lot of people missed, and part of the reason the compilers refused to implement it was because there was no way to turn it off until C++ 11. That is, every object gets a constructor, a destructor, a copy constructor, and the equal operator. If you whether you des describe them or not, even if you make them private, they exist and they will be used. If you create an object in C++ 3 or later, which is all compilers at this point, every object you define, even if you call it private, you will get a copy constructor. It will get used. So if you declare it private and it's wrong, it'll get used anyway and your code won't work. And it won't work in very strange and unexpected ways. The only way to prevent the creation of equal operators and copy constructors is like this. And again, I can't type because I can't see it. Some object like that. So if you declare, now this would be your default constructor, but if I say if I say that, now I'm deleting the copy constructor. That object, if I put that in the definition of the object, won't have a copy constructor. And that's the only way to prevent it. So if you have an object that should not or must not be copied, you have to do that. If you don't, the old trick of making it private doesn't work. And there's a lot of code that's compiling now that has very strange errors. It's old code. There's a lot of old C++ code. A lot of those strange errors come from this. The reason that was done in C++ 3 was to support a concept, and I'll just type it here, that's sometimes shortened to RAII. Resource acquisition is initialization. The idea there is to eliminate to the maximum extent possible the use of the, of the operator new. If you don't new your memory, you don't have to delete it. And that's the largest source of resource leaks and other pointer related errors in the system is this constant use of new and delete. If in my class I simply say something like that and I don't use a pointer, I'm good. I can assign to it, I can copy it, I can do whatever I need to with it, 
It's allocated when the object is created. It's deallocated when the object is destroyed. And I don't have to do a darn thing. Well-constructed C++ 11 or later code usually has empty constructors and empty destructors because your objects are allocated this way. The only time you still need pointers is when you're using polymorphism. If you have polymorphic objects, you got to use a pointer because polymorphic objects cannot be referenced as their base type directly. Only a reference or a pointer can be polymorphic. A direct allocation, a direct de declaration like this, never polymorphic. It does not, if you say it's a base type, it is the base type. It's not a subtype, and it can't be a subtype. It can't receive a copy of it either. So you do have to be a little careful when you have objects that inherit from other objects, because there you still have to use pointers. If you don't inherit, though, and a lot of the, most of the standard library doesn't have any inheritance at all, it's pure template, then you don't need to worry about it. You can just allocate directly. When you need pointers. So in C++ 98, they created this thing called standard auto pointer, which turned out to be a really bad name. Because people thought, oh, this is a pointer that just automatically takes care of its, uh, of its memory. Not exactly. Standard auto pointer had an interesting characteristic in that if you copy an auto pointer, whatever you copied invalidates itself. So if you said standard auto pointer Now I'm skipping the template. There's a you have to templatize the type here, but for clarity, I'm just skipping some of that. And then I said, something like that. So by Copying it to another refer another value, something is now invalid. If I try to dereference it, I will get a failure. That confused enough people that in C++11, they changed the name. So if you see code with auto pointer, you should not use it. We changed the name to unique. Unique pointer, and the reason for the change was exactly this. Unique pointer much more clearly expresses that this is a unique copy. And if I copy it, whatever I copied from has lost it. Now, if I need to have two things owning the pointer, don't use unique pointer. Use shared. So the point of both of these is that unique pointer says, I have one copy, I own it. Shared pointer says, there may be other copies. We share it. The last one who owns it is the one who deletes it. Unique pointer says, when I'm done with it, I'm deleting it. If you need to allocate a point, uh, if you need to allocate memory with new inside a method, so like a temporary, you probably want a unique pointer. If you have something that is uniquely owned by your object, now, you should always know what owns memory. That's a key characteristic of C++, especially in C++11 and later. You need to know who owns the memory. These smart pointers express that. Does this object own it? Or is it shared with other objects that might own it in common? Use of these pointers helps to ensure that it's clear. That's why they changed the names in the standard. And that's why it's important to use these instead of raw pointers. If you're still using raw pointers, you should probably begin migrating off of those to the maximum extent possible. Raw pointers are not good in C++, and they really shouldn't be used. Either use unique or shared. And again, you're expressing clearly who owns the memory. Another change to, this, to the language. A lot of this is around 
a lot of this occurred because the standards committee made a very explicit decision. C++ is not C. They're different languages. They've always been very different languages. And they aren't even truly binary compatible. They can be made to be, but they truly aren't. And it's only the linker's ability to understand both that allows us to link them. Libraries written in one to libraries written in another. But they don't actually generate compatible object code. Um, they're mangled in different ways, and so the object code is, is not matchable. Um, but the linker understands both and sort of hides that from us, which is good. It allows a C++ program to use C libraries and vice versa. It's a good thing. Technically, the C library gets upgraded to C++ if you do that. Slight tweak. But they're not the same language. And the committee has very clearly begun to move away from any similarities. Um, one of the things that's interesting in C, I'm going to go ahead and delete this. I should have had a W there. I apologize. Again, I can't see what I'm typing. <laughs> so what happens if I declare I get this right. So if I did this and that's the entire function and I never use that value, the compiler is going to give me a warning. Hey, that, that thing you declared there, it's unused. Now, let's say that I know it's unused, I want it to be unused, there's some reason for keeping it there, maybe something else inspects into the code, I've got some weird byte manipulation library that goes and reads things, I need to have the value there. Okay, that's fine. Maybe I have some assembly code somewhere that interacts with this and it needs things to be aligned in a certain way. Sure, no problem. In C, this would cause all sorts of problems. In C, that would be declaring a rarely used type of value, type of scalar. In C++, that is a compiler instruction. So they deliberately broke compatibility with C in that case. They said, you know what? This is a rarely used element of C. We don't really care if it works in C++. We think it's a much cleaner syntax than any of the alternatives, and we need these compiler instruction attributes. And so they replaced that particular set of structures in C with this. This is a, an instruction to the compiler, and there's a small set of these that are defined in the standard. Maybe unused is new for C++17. If you're using a slightly older version of GCC, you can do this. Does the same thing. But that only works for GCC because it's a GNU, a GNU specific value. Any other compiler that's compliant will just ignore it. They won't complain, they'll just skip it. That's a requirement of the standard starting with C11. So this is just an attribute, and it says, hey, this is an unused value. Don't warn me about it. GNU has a ton of these. They used to be done like this, and it's kind of clunky. It used to be done like that. That was GNU's way of doing attributes. Uh, not the prettiest thing. Can be confused with macros. Can be overridden by a macro. Can do a lot of weird things. The standards committee discussed back and forth quite a bit. By the way, the standards are all pub their, their entire discussion 
is published on GitHub. So unlike most ISO standards committees, the C++ standards committee works entirely in the open. This was a big fight with ISO itself because ISO requires that all final standards be something that you pay for. You cannot obtain standards for free from ISO. The committee publishes a final draft on their GitHub and then the actual final standard has to go through a final edit and be slightly different and then published only through ISO. They try to keep it only to textual changes, but those that there are slight differences. Again, that's an ISO requirement, but all of the development occurs on GitHub, completely in the open. This is kind of nice. Anyway, attributes are another new feature in C++ 11 and later. And it looks like that. Again, that particular one is C++ 17. Prior to 17, you can use the GNU extension. Um, Microsoft has an extension as well, as does Clang. Um, I'm not sure about the Intel compiler. The other major changes in C++ have been the standard library. Now, there's a lot of things that have been missing from the standard library, starting with the first standard version in C9, C++ 98. Recent changes from C++ 11 and C++ 14. I'm not even, other than string view, I'm not going to mention the new additions for C++ 17. But in C++ 14, we gained some very nice, useful features. Standard thread. Pthreads is no longer required. It is automatically used on Linux. Other threading models are automatically used on other platforms. Standard thread is the preferred threading model for C++ 11 and later. Particularly C++ 14. In 14, they also added future and promise. Now, if you're used to things like Node.js, you're very used to things like futures and promises. When you're doing asynchronous programming, more recently, that is the preferred paradigm of you call a method, it returns a future saying, I will give you a value at some time in the future. When the calling thread is ready, it says, hey, I'd like to get that value, and then it blocks waiting for the return for, for the results from the other thread. You can also offer a promise to a thread that's going to run, and then you can fill in the promise when you get a chance and the, th the, thre the other thread will block waiting for that promise. So you can give a promise, receive a future, fill in the promise, and then wait on the result. And the threads will automatically synchronize waiting on the values they need. It's much cleaner and it avoids a lot of shared memory kludges that used to be required in C++. It's not perfect, but it's much better than it used to be. The standard collections have been substantially improved. Um, if you haven't looked at them in a while, you absolutely should. There are a number of other new features. There are file system features. If you want to know what's new or what's coming in C++, the best place to look is the Boost library. For instance, asynchronous I.O is currently scheduled for, ad for addition to C++ 20. It was going to be in C++ 17, but they had some last minute concerns with it and decided to postpone. Um, there is some asynchronous I.O. in 17, I believe. I haven't read the final draft. Um, but asynchronous I.O. in the standard library is a big deal. If you're using Boost a ASIO or ASIO, you're basically using standard C++ standard asynchronous I.O. already. Um, the changes between the standard and ASIO are minimal. Uh, mostly it's just a namespace change. Um, other changes, there are a number of sort of usability changes and some minor tweaks. Um, there are some interesting sort of optimization changes. One thing that people have often been very concerned about with C++ is if you have, and let's just say this is, we'll do this up here. So let's say that I wanted to return
So let's say I'm returning a standard string. Now, this would be something, something of a no-no. People would be very concerned about this, primarily because, if I can see if I can type this right. Um, doing that copies string, and string is not a small object. Um, and it's a little bit costly to copy. So C++ being primarily performance focused, the concern has always been, hey, I don't want to copy memory if I don't have to. C++ 11 and later has officially in the standard what's called copy elision. What that means is, in this, in this case, it's a um, named return value optimization, NRVO. It says, hey, compiler, if you want, and GCC almost always will if optimization is turned on. This is a named value. You can go ahead and allocate that in the callers stack and reference it in the object, in the function call. So what happens is it avoids the copy. It actually moves the allocation up to the up one level and just references it in, inside this function at that higher level. So it allocates it in the stack before calling the function, calls the function, that's the memory that gets referenced for that, for that particular variable, and on return, it's already in the caller's context. So it eludes, avoids, the copy of that object. GCC with aggressive optimization can get really interesting about this one. <laughs> There are times, it's not common, but I've seen GCC actually allocate about six levels up and just keep referencing it all the way down and back up just because it's safe to do so and the optimizer is able to verify that. Won't do that very often because it's rarely going to be something that can work where it doesn't change in ways that shouldn't. But copy elision, uh, specifically named return value optimization, is well implemented in all the major compilers and it avoids a lot of these copies. So it's less important to return pointers and pass in values and then modify them in the object. You can just create it in the, in the function and return it and be fine with it. Um, C++ 14 expands that slightly and again in 17 they've clarified the language to make it even more likely that copies will be avoided. It's not always going to happen, and it can help to read that portion of the standard if you're not sure, particularly if your code is very performance intensive. But most of the time, it's not worth worrying about. Not anymore. Used to be, but not, not so much anymore. Um, returning a reference is still a very bad idea. Don't do that. <laughs> um, it can work sometimes, but it's generally not wise because it actually breaks copy elision. So it ends up forcing a copy at the point of assignment is usually what the compilers end up doing. Um, beyond that, it's worth going ahead and looking at, I'll just type these in. Um, actually, I'll pull up a browser and show you. It is absolutely worth Taking a look at two locations. I'm going to pull them up here and then I'll pull them onto the screen. If I can, there we go. So there are two reference sites that are very useful. One, C++.com, is a good basic reference, particularly if you're not s extremely comfortable with C++. Um, and it, it organizes by header, which can be very helpful if you're not sure where objects are. CPP reference, on the other hand, is far better as a reference to the library itself. Sorry, to the language itself. And is often edited by the committee members on the standards committee. 
not all the time, but often. Um, I should mention a few other things you probably want to look at um, that I forgot. Um, atomic operations start showed up in C++11 if I ha need an atomic int or an atomic long long. Those are available. That can avoid a lot of locking issues. There's also an automatically managed mutex lock available in C++11 where and this is important when you have exceptions in the language, which we do. You can acquire, you, you basically just declare a guarded lock around your mutex, which creates an object on your stack that locks the mutex as part of its constructor. Its destructor releases the mutex. So if you have an exception that you didn't expect, during stack unwinding, your mutex gets unlocked and you avoid deadlock. Anytime you're locking, unless you need to lock beyond the method you're in, you absolutely should be using the guarded lock class. Um, whoops, it tapped on me here. Um, there's also some lock free, free things, some compare exchange. There's some useful things in Atomic that are worth paying attention to. Um, guarded lock is actually in the memory uh, library the same place that um, smart pointers are. Um, sorry, it's in thread. It's the same place thread is. Uh, I apologize. Um, there's a regular expressions library that's now part of the standard. So if you need regular expressions in C++, no need to pull in an external library. It's in the standard. Um, there are algorithms, um, some fairly advanced numerics. A lot of the BLAST library is already is incorporated in the standard now. Um, there's still some things for which you need an external library, but a lot of common numeric operations, including some fairly advanced uh, linear algebra, is in the standard now. Um, as I mentioned, containers are expanded. Um, what was the other one? There was another one I was going to mention. Uh, algorithms. So things like I want to apply this. Oh, yeah. Really big one in C++14, closures. So a limited form of closures was added in C++14. So if I need to declare, hey, I want to run this little piece of code on every object in the container, there's a syntax in the, in the language. Um, it's a little bit goofy. I recommend looking it up. That allows me to declare a basically a function object in line in the call. So there's an algorithm that applies a function given to it to every object in a container in the algorithms library uh, for each. There's another one called transform that's intended to actually change every object in, in the um, uh, container. So for instance, I can take a standard string. In C++11 and later, standard strings.cster is not constant anymore, and it's guaranteed to be, um, oh, sorry, it is constant, but you can cheat. Um, but it's guaranteed to be uh, contiguous. So you can now pass cster, you can now um, use the data, you can take the address of the first value, the first, um, the first uh, character in a string, and treat that as a, a mutable char pointer and it'll work correctly within the limitations of the storage of the string. So you can use things like snprintf on a, into a standard string and it works, which is kind of nice. Um, but you can also use things like standard transform. So I can take a string, use the standard transform algorithm, and I can declare a closure that takes every character given to it and changes it to uppercase. And effectively write two upper in one line. So it transforms standard string to its uppercase equivalent using the locale, whatever the current locale is. Um, I can also ru run to lower on standard string in the same way. I can replace certain characters in a string with a transform. So I can go through and transform the string and have a closure that says, hey, if I see a backslash, well, actually, not backslash, let's say I, if I see a, a um, carriage return, a line feed, or a form feed, 
I'm going to replace those with their URL equivalents because I want to turn this string into a JSON safe string. No problem. Takes about three lines. Um, again, look up standard transform, especially here because they have an example that does basically that. Um, so this is a great resource, and I recommend looking through it when you have time, especially if you're doing any sort of C++ development. Because C++ has changed enough, especially if you haven't looked at it, the, the change standards since, say, C++ 98 or C++ 03. Um, there's enough of a change that it's absolutely worth looking through this when you have the time. Start with the keywords because there's some new ones, and then work through from there. Um, in fact, I think Keywords might be where that is. I'm just going to look for it real quick. Um, so you can see that there are some new t keywords. No accept, null pointer. Uh, yes. Um, if, you're st if you encounter code that, said that checks pointers for equal to zero or equal to null, or assigns them equal to zero or equal to null in all caps, replace that with null, p null ptr, please. It's now a keyword. and the compilers are cheating. They're not assigning zero or null. You know, zero basically. Null is a preprocessor keyword that replace that gets replaced with zero. They're not actually assigning zero or checking against zero when dealing with pointers. They know that it's a pointer. The compiler does. It has to know this is a pointer, and I'm comparing to zero, and it actually compares to whatever the null pointer is for the platform, which is never zero on Linux, by the way. <laughs> um, nor is it zero on Windows either. And as far as I know, it's not zero on Mac OS X. Um, it compares to what it knows as a null pointer. And that has a lot of variability to it. The null pointer keyword makes that more explicit and clear. And it also allows for some optimization that cleans things up a little bit. So it's worth going ahead and replacing those if you're ed editing the code anyway. It still works. Equals zero still works. Testing against zero still works, but assigning it null PTR as a keyword, and then just you, instead of if equal to null, just say if, because null PTR evaluate has a Boolean operator that evaluates to false. So it it saves a little bit of a headache um, that can happen in some edge corner cases, and over time, eventually that zero is null pointer is going to go away. We just don't know when. Depends on when the majority of C++ changes. Um, so a few other things to note. Uh, like I said, const expert is new. Decal type is something used a lot in Windows. It's not as much used in Linux. Um, and it's a, a type, uh, it's a form of type declaration. It's worth looking at if you're interested. I don't use it very often. I don't know a lot of code that uses it very often, except Windows, which uses it everywhere. So if you're going to be doing Windows programming, get used to it. Um, this is also a good place to see what's coming. For instance, requires is coming in C++20. That's related to concepts, where you can say, hey, I've got this object, and it needs these things. These concepts have to be present in order for this object to be used. And so you can have several different templatizations of a class that are selected based on the support for certain concepts present when the object is created at runtime. They're still working on that, but it's pretty interesting. And if you want to see sort of an early version of it, boost log, so the boost logging uh, library, uses a similar thing in its sync declarations. So you can see sort of how that would look if you look at boost log and their syncs. Um, there's some other examples in boost. But again, you can also just follow the, the standards committee. They've already begun working on C++20 concepts starting in July. They switched over from C17, which they felt was done, started working on 20. So if you follow them on GitHub, you can see some of the early work towards concepts. Uh, started with a tech spec anyway, which is pretty fully fleshed. So if you read through that, you can see a lot of what concepts are going to look like and why these are useful. Um, that's most of the major things. Like I said, there's the big thing worth paying attention to 
By the way, if you see a one here, like this, that's a reference that the keyword has been changed from what it used to be. So there's the early standards, and this is a keyword that used to have one meaning and now has a different meaning. Uh, again, if, you, if you're dealing with code that you're pulling forward, it's worth paying attention to that. Um, that's most of it. There's a lot there. I've only sort of scratched the surface. Um, the language is almost unrecognizable from what it was in the late 90s. And even as recently as maybe five years ago, most code was still written to that standard. So a lot of the code you see is not going to look like it should for modern compilers. Um, the C++ community, committee has more or less committed to a new standard every three years, which for its ISO standards is amazing. Most ISO standards update about every once every 10 to 15 years. So updating it every three years is impressive as heck, and they work hard. Uh, that committee meets more often than most, sta most standards committees, and when they meet, they do a lot more work. Um, a lot less politics than most committees. It's pretty impressive. Working in the open helps to see what's going on. And even if you're just mildly interested in standards committees in general, looking at their open meeting details can be very informative. It can help you understand why sometimes standards take a long time and other standards get done quickly. And sometimes the things you get in the standard are not quite as pretty as you'd like them to be. Does anyone have any questions? Sure. So uh, I got a compiler question. Sure. And it ties back into with it, Ed. Yes. Uh, into his presentation. So on the container OS is, uh, I guess most of the major distributions of Linux are compiled with the, the GLC. And uh, for this Alpine Linux, which is kind of like a minimalist type of uh, distribution, is using Musil. Is it bring a bell or is it? So glibc is, a, is the C runtime. It's not C++. Um, glibc++ is the C++ runtime. Um, and yes, fundamentally everything on the system that's native code has to bind, has to link, statically link usually glibc, although sometimes it's a shared, it uses a shared object. Uh, but it has to bind glibc and glibc++ if it's C++ code. Uh, but for, for this particular distribution, using this different type of uh, C library or whatever, it gets, it gets more strict, like post compliant, and there's, a, there's like a like better stuff. So yeah. Compiled, when it's compiled, it, it is, is uh, more stringent standards on how it's compiled, and there's some mm -hmm. other issues in there. If one of you could just like talk about that a little bit. Um, well, that gets into more of the, o, the OS interaction with the runtime libraries. Um, there are some versions of Linux. Um, BusyBox kernels usually link to a smaller libc. Um, a lot of these sort of embedded Linux, Linux versions will link to a reduced libc. Um, there's some common ones. Um, BusyBox um, has theirs, which I forget the name of. Um, Wind River has their own libc. And they usually shrink down by being super tight on standards. So like, hey, here's the C runtime for POSIX. And if you want anything beyond POSIX, tough luck, you're not getting it. Um, if you're compiling for an embedded Linux, you'll have to pay attention to that and avoid using any extensions. A lot of those are still C90 which means um, you're not going to get a lot of new features. Um, it also means that building C++ code is kind of not going to work right. Um, it sort of does, sort of doesn't. You have to use their compiler because their compiler fills in the gaps between C++ and C. Because C++ requires, in order for the language to function, expanded runtime over the C runtime. That's why there's glibc++. Um, 
it depends entirely on what embedded system you're working on. And you're just going to have to read through their docs to understand what they support and what they don't. Um, there's pretty much no way around that on the embedded side. Um, again, every embedded system is shrinking things down. Now, the one thing I know that will get around that is if you static link. So you cross compile on a different system and static link your runtime. What you can do, you can static link the C runtime, you can static link the C++ runtime. Oh, I'm not going to static link anything. I'm coming to you for any type of C++ compiler <laughs> issue. I think I understood like three things up here. GCC, a variable, a string. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand the rest of those. Const. Get up there. Yeah. Const. Const. Const, right. Const and const expert. Um, const expert is nice because you can move some really hairy allocation down into the compiler um, for things that are constant, that don't change. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, if you're dealing with embedded, you're just going to have to like read the documentation for the embedded system you're working with. Um, and actually, a lot of them will tell you, "Hey, static link your your C your C runtime. Just don't even don't even try. Static link it. Done." Um, and they don't even deliver a shared object. Um, I have a busy box Linux that I have a little bit of my code running on at home. It has no glibc. It has no libc of any kind. Um, everything's static linked just the choice they made. Totally fine. Uh, uses a little more disk space, but then you are able to minimize um, the kernel in some interesting ways, and that's why they did it that way. They're not running very many binaries. Don't need to share, ob share the object. Works out. Um, any other questions? Is uh, isocpp.org another view of the the ISO people. ISOCPP.org is an independent site that is pulling from the GitHub and publishing what they can. Um, obviously, it's illegal for them to pull the official standard and publish that um, because ISO owns it and they demand payment. <laughs> no exceptions. No ISO standard is allowed to be published without payment. If someone tells you, hey, here's the ISO standard, it's free, either they stole it and they're going to go to jail at some point because ISO is very aggressive about enforcing that, or they're lying. Um, you can always go to ISO.org and pay the fee to get the actual standard if you need it. As a practitioner writing C++, you don't need the actual standard. The drafts that are available on GitHub or references like this are plenty. If you're implementing a compiler, yeah, you're probably going to have to buy the standard. Um, so yeah, ISO CPP is just an independent site. I found it less useful than going directly to the GitHub or reading this. But your mileage may vary. I subscribe to the feed. Interesting yeah. stuff shows up. So, and there are members of the committee that publish independently blogs and other resources. But they have to be very careful because as committee members, they've signed documentation that says, hey, I won't publish things that I shouldn't. So they have to be a little careful what they publish themselves. Thank you. <laughs>